We're talking about fear hindering Christian marriage or relationships. And I see two fundamental issues in marriages. We've already done four, five counselings this month uh, related to marriage, related to relationship. And so one of the things that I see, two fundamental issues uh, that we're born with and we develop is that we have a man-centered focus and a self-centered focus, and these are beliefs more than a God-centered focus. So what this means is that we believe, we don't realize it, but we believe that our mate in our marriage is more immediate and a more immediate and important source uh, of happiness than God. You say, well, how do you know that? I know that because people spend their life disappointed about their marriage, but not about God. I mean, they spend their life fearful that it won't turn out well, but not fearful about their relationship with God. The people that come and talk, they're not focused as how well or poorly they're doing with God. It's how well or poorly they're doing in their human relationships. So that's the focus of their life. And so... That's a man-centered focus, and it's idolatry. When you put anything above God as your happiness, as you, what you depend upon for fulfillment or your life to have meaning and purpose, that's an idol. That's a God that you worship. So, now the second is that we're self-centered. And this is all part of Adam's original sin, a part of having a sin nature. Uh, we place self-interest meaning what I want or protecting myself from what I don't want, like hurt or criticism. What I want, which I'm pursuing through this other person, and what I don't want, and so I'm protecting myself above surrender to God's interest. I put me above God. I mean, what I want or what I don't want is more important to me than what God wants. Now, this is normal human living, even for believers who are growing and advancing. We start out controlled by self-interest. The miracle of salvation and spiritual growth is the only possible way anybody ever gets beyond that. You don't get beyond that without the Holy Spirit. So, we're willing to love like Christ and submit like Christ as long as we don't have to make ourselves vulnerable. You don't, you don't want to be vulnerable. So, the, see, when you're, when you're mate-centered, marriage and mate-centered, it's often risky to be vulnerable. Volatile person. Someone caught in disobedience, trapped in their sin, going to be a reaction toward you. But the trick is the vulnerability has to be toward God. Has to be toward God more than it is toward your mate. And, and that's what, see, we, we have these commands, husband, love your wife. Like Christ loved the church. Wives submit to your husband like the church is to Christ. We think that that's some human endeavor that we're supposed to produce and, and we fight against it. We reject it because you can't do it in your humanity. And it's not what's going to please the humanity in you. You know, the human part of marriage, it's not good for man to be alone. See, that's a normal thing for believer and unbeliever. But Christian marriage is a mission. It's a mission. It's a calling way beyond what you want or don't want. It's a calling beyond that that requires the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully I'll be able to convey that. So when you're, when you're mate-centered or marriage-centered and self-centered, my purpose for marriage is to have my mate meet my human needs and fulfill my desires. That's why I'm in this. 
I am in this so that that other person can give to me what I need from it, what I want from it. And if that other person is not doing that, doesn't seem interested in doing that, then I'm very upset and my life has, is not good. Because that's our focus, that's our priority. So, God's purpose for Christian marriage is to use the inevitable conflicts in Christian marriage to break down our man, man-centered, mate-centered, self-centered thinking while developing in us the capacity to surrender our self-interest so that we can accomplish his goals to help our mate grow closer to Christ. God has you in this to develop in you spiritual maturity, selflessness, God-centeredness, to be able to have a ministry to your mate. Loving your wife like Christ loved the church is a ministry to your mate to help them draw closer to the Lord. Submission to the husband is a ministry to him to help him and edify him in the Lord. It's not a personal preference. It's not even about compatibility. That's the human side of it. The spiritual side of it is that this is a mission from the Lord that you've been given. Now, Christian marriage is designed to create a visual aid of Christ in the church. That's Ephesians chapter 5. Creating this image is only possible when two spiritually advancing believers walk in the power of the Spirit and obey the Word of God. That's the only time this is possible. These commands to love and submit are not for the hu- your humanity. That's not what unbelievers can do. This is a mission from the Lord. It requires the ministry of the Spirit. It requires maturity in your life. It requires that you follow and obey God's Word. It's beyond what we think of as marriage. It's beyond. It's a, it's a spiritual mission. This mission transcends our human needs and boundaries, inviting us, inviting us into a ministry for the Lord, for Him to use us to reveal His love and grace to a mate who may be trapped in disobedience, in reversionism, maybe they're depressed, they're in despair. I recently did a counseling with a couple and it came out in the discussion that the wife was very controlling. She was very fearful about letting him leave. He, he's not smart. I'm smarter than he is. The times that I've let him take the lead, he's messed it all up. Got us into debt, did this, did that. I can't afford to let him leave. He's not very smart. I mean, these things were said. And his word is there, you know. She's very demeaning. She's very critical. There's there's no affection. There's no sex. There's no intimacy. It's all walls. And this lady, she didn't deny it. What she wouldn't do is admit that that wasn't God's plan. She insisted that this was necessary for her life to work. So the guy said, counselor, preacher, what do I do? What do I do with that? I mean, she's definitely not going to approach this from a biblical standpoint. This is very unfair. I mean, listen, it was to a degree, I've done a lot of these, it was to the degree I was a little bit aback. And he said, well, what do, I, what do I do? I said, what does the Bible tell you to do as a husband? And he looked at me and he said, so what does the Bible tell you to do? He said, love my wife like Christ loved the church. So that's what God wants you to do. 
but but she but she but this but that I'm like what did the Bible tell you to do do you trust God do you believe what he's telling you is what he wants you to do and that that is and that is your blessing and that is your security do you trust God or do you trust this human incompatibility you've got here do you trust that you can find meaning and purpose and joy in life through obeying God in this relationship and being a minister to this woman or to this man because you love the Lord and He's more important in your life than whether this works out in a human way the way you want it to work out. Whether your partner's doing what you want them to do or not. Can you come to a place in your life where God is more important than that so that you're willing to do what he said even when you're not getting the return you want because there's no guarantee of a positive return this person may not ever change there's no guarantees of that that's a personal choice between them and the Lord but as for you you have to decide what your life's going to be and who you're going to honor and who you're going to obey and what you're going to make important So, fear shuts down our walk. It shuts it down. The walk is by faith. It shuts down the walk. It shuts down growth. Causes us to build strongholds of self-protection. And we lose out on being part of the miracle that God is performing every day. Just in Genesis 3, we just talked it. Of how they hid, they were afraid. Now, if you'll open your Bibles, I've written it on here, but I want you to, if you will, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. We'll read all six verses. First Peter chapter 3. This is a series of Peter talking about submission. Submission to governmental authorities, submission to unfair, brutal slave masters. The submission of Christ to the Father to go to the cross. And in this series of talking about submission in unfair situations, he, he reaches the wife who's, who's a married woman who got saved and her husband, husband didn't. She's, she's saved, but the husband didn't get saved. So, in the same way, as you submit to the government, as you submit to, to masters, as Christ submitted to the Father, in the same way, wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if, any, if they are not obedient to the word, they may be one, that's one to, one to Christ, without a word, by the behavior of their wives. And he goes on, as you observe, if they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, uh, not the outer beauty, but the inner beauty. He says in verse 4, let it be the hidden person of the heart. And verse 5, for in this way, the former times, the holy women who trusted in God used to adorn themselves by being submissive to their own husbands. Then he's going to give us an example. And... Up until now, I have missed this. I, I didn't really understand what was being said. But in verse 6, he says, Like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children, or you will be her children, or you will be like her, if you do what is right, that's already been stated in verse 1, Without being frightened by any fear. Okay, without being frightened by any fear. That's a strange statement. There's two words for fear. One's a verb, without being frightened by any, uh, toasis is the word, toasis. And toasis is a word that means to be frightened by something sudden. How do we know that? Well, the only other place in the Bible this word is used is in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And in Hebrew, I mean in Proverbs 325, 
the writer says, do not be afraid of sudden fear, but to toasis. In other words, something sudden that comes upon you and frightens you. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, um, nor the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and you will, he will keep your foot from being caught. So, toasis, sudden frightening event. This is probably in 1 Peter 3, the husband's anger, husband's sin of anger. You know, men, here's an unbelieving man. He's not saved. He's not spiritual. And, and she's in this situation with him. So he says, Peter's saying that there's going to be all kinds of reactions. But you're to be submissive like Sarah. So you go, well, how was Sarah submissive in calling Abraham? You go back to Genesis 18. Well, in Genesis 18, 10 through 15. The Lord said, I will surely return to you, this is to Abraham, at this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now she's 90 and he's 99. Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind the Lord. The Lord couldn't see her. And Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and Sarah was past childbearing. So Sarah laughed within herself. That's what we call that inner dialogue. She laughed inside. Uh, after, and she said to herself, after I have become old, shall I have the pleasure, my Lord. She calls him Lord. This is when she calls Abraham Lord. The only time in Genesis that she calls him Lord. Shall I have this pleasure, my Lord, being so old? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did Sarah doubt and laugh? See, she's not just laughing. She's doubting. She's doubting. In a minute, she's going to be fearful. Why did Sarah laugh? And at the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. Why? For she was afraid. And he said, the Lord said, no, but you did laugh. God said that he would produce a miracle child. See, you have to understand what's going on here. This is the first miracle child that's a precursor of the virgin birth. She's barren. It's not that she just can't have children. She's barren. She's 90 years old. She's beyond her her uh, reproductive uh, faculties are dried up and gone. Okay? And so this is going to be a miracle. God said that I'm going to produce a miracle in your life. So, he would produce a miracle child, and rather than trusting him and rejoicing in the promise of God, listen, rather than trusting him and rejoicing in his promise, Sarah doubted and laughed losing her capacity to function in the miracle of the moment. When God fronted her about her doubt, she lied out of fear, losing out on the joy of the moment. Now, what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 3, he is describing the spiritual miracle of a wife filled with the Spirit Expressing God's love and grace through her submission to her unbelieving husband. My contention, and I think what this is teaching, is that the husband's loving his wife like Christ loved the church, truly, and her submitting like the church is to submit to Christ, is a miracle of God. It's a miracle of God that that could ever happen in the soul of a selfish person could ever come to a place where you're willing to give yourself to the Lord to, to serve in that ministry. That's a miracle. And what Peter's saying is if the fear of being vulnerable in that relationship, in that situation, is going to be, is going to overwhelm you, you're going to miss out. 
And you're not going to be able to function in that moment as God desires for you. You're going to miss it. See, everybody wants their marriage to be good. God's trying to tell you how to make it good. And it's not about getting what you earthly want. It's about surrendering yourself to Him to be able to give Him what He's looking for out of it. That's what makes it the way it's supposed to be. That's what gives you peace in it. That's what gives you confidence in it. That's what frees you from the other person's failures. Now, husbands are addressed with anger and bitterness. And when husbands express anger and bitterness to their wives who have made themselves vulnerable in a personal way, that's very hurtful. Women are easily hurt in that way. So I'm not going to tell you how I know that. Uh, But I do know that. The temptation is to be afraid that if I put myself in that position because God asked me to and commanded me to do that, to fulfill this ministry to this man, that I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to get hurt in it. And so you build walls. You build walls. Rather than making yourself vulnerable to the Lord, you build walls between you and your partner. Men too. Both, both sides, of you build walls. Like I said last time, you escape You build a wall, you escape, and then you find some way to medicate yourself, whatever it is to distract you and find some enjoyment out of life. So Peter is saying that a Christian husband's spirit-powered unconditional love to his wife and a Christian wife's spirit-powered submission to the Lord through her husband is a miracle comparable to that of God causing Sarah to conceive. Peter is comparing that to God enabling Sarah to conceive. It's a miracle if it happens. It's a miracle if you give yourself to it and actually allow the Spirit to give you that love and to give you that confidence to express to your mate. So, it's as much a miracle as your spiritual gift It's as much of a miracle as anything. So, just as doubt and fear hindered Sarah's ability to embrace God's word in her life, a wife's fear of being vulnerable to her husband's reactions, his toasis, shuts down her ministry of influencing him for Christ. Listen, submitting to a husband is not about of course, this was the common order of the day. This was the social structure. There really wasn't a lot of options here for a woman. Women have a lot more options today, but in the Lord, they don't. In the Lord, this is a ministry to him to bring him closer to the Lord. The wife's submission is a ministry. Okay, it's not about persuading him. It's not about getting him where you want him to be or getting the reaction you want. It's an unconditional grace-giving to that man to influence him so he can see God's love and grace. Same for the husband. When you, when you don't allow her misbehavior in your relationship to influence you and you love her like Christ loved the church, anyway, no matter what, it fulfills God's image of Christ in the church, which is the mission. So... The question for me, for you, is where are you in your growth to be able to put what God wants out of your life ahead of what you want out of your life? For your capacity to, to say, Lord, I will stick myself, I will put myself in this vulnerable position for this guy I just described to be. To be demeaned by my wife. I'm going to love her like Christ loves the church anyway. Whatever she does. Doesn't matter. Because my command is to love. Whatever he does. My command is to submit. Now what does that mean? I don't think it's like a military submit. I think it's a 
a cooperation and a joining together and a working together. You'll have to figure out what you think the Lord means by that in your life, ladies. But there's no, there's no getting around it. There's no getting around it. So, the question comes up, and it comes up every time I discuss this. Well, what about if I'm in this situation? A woman shouldn't allow herself to be abused. Whoever said that she should? Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying that you should be beat up or put in, put in jeopardy for real. The question is, in your personal situation, are you willing to give yourself to the Lord? Maybe it's difficult. Maybe it's not what you want it to be. Maybe it's not what it should be. But are you willing to give yourself to the Lord for Him to use you to create that side of Christ in the church image? Are you willing to be used by that? And to, and to let God take care of whatever fallout or toasis comes from it. Are you willing to give yourself to the Lord in that way? This is what Christ did. See, this is where we're headed. It's where Christ went. Are you willing to be like Christ in, in, in sacrificing yourself for the sake of God's mission and putting yourself in a vulnerable position? That's the question. That's what Christian marriage is about. You know, people come and talk about the human part of their marriage. You know, he's, he's overbearing. He's this. He's that. He always thinks about his job. Well, you know, she always is afraid of, she wants to keep up with her sisters or, her, you know, she got to keep up with everybody else. She's always afraid of what other people are going to think. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, how do you fix that stuff? First of all, you enter into the Lord's mission. And many of those things are handled by compromise. Personal stuff. Who takes out the garbage? Well, whoever, who washes the dishes? In our house, it's whoever gets to them first. You know, there's no assigned duties there. We just share it, you know. Sometimes I get the garbage and sometimes Rhonda does. We just share the, the duties. The... Now, I've been, I've been banned from the washing machine, but <laughs> that doesn't hurt my feelings. So, what is fear? Fear can be a lot of things. There's a good fear, which is fear of the Lord, and there's a bad fear, which is a mental sin. Fear is a natural, powerful survival mechanism. It is a chemical and emotional reaction to a real or imagined threat. According to psychological research, it involves a universal, this is universal in every culture, biochemical response and an individual emotional response. So this toasis, this sudden fright, creates a chemical reaction in your brain. And it's a universal reaction. Fear can be a warning alerting us to the presence of real danger or threat of harm, whether that danger is physical or psychological. Listen to your gut. Ladies, if you're in a store and your gut tells you that there's danger out there, then listen to it. Listen to it. You know, listen to the Spirit. Fear or awe or reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But mature wisdom with the Lord re removes fear. It's love. You know, mature love casts out fear. As a mental sin, fear is a reaction to an imagined threat of an attack or a loss. Just like the army of Israel was afraid of Goliath. They imagined themselves dying, and they believed, if I go out there, see, so they created this image in their head of them being pulled apart, and then they, they believed it, and that produced fear. How about fear of death? The mental sin of fear shuts down the believer's faith, and therefore the capacity to participate in the supernatural miracles that God wants to do through our lives. Anything, I think it's so easy for us who've studied so much for so long to be sort of numb to 
the miracle of the Holy Spirit empowering you with the Word of God in your life to think the thoughts of Christ and to have the love of Christ for others. That's a huge miracle. It's a miracle. And, and, and I hope that when you hear that, you're like, I want to be part of that. I want to enjoy that. I want to embrace that. But fear, what, you're, what are you afraid of? See, what are you afraid that you'll never get that you want? Or what is it you already have that you're afraid you're going to lose? Whatever that is, is what you've made into your idol. If, if you think, well, I, I just can't die without my marriage working out the way I want. And that's very common. Then your marriage is your idol. And your fear is, we'll never get it right. Or if I have a good marriage or an enjoyable marriage, I'll lose it. You know, somebody will come along or this person will die. You're fearful. It shuts down your ability to enter into that relationship and enjoy it and fulfill God's purpose for you in it. Fear. Fear. The more I look around, the more I see fear. I've given these examples, Numbers 13 and 14, the Exodus generation. Refused to go into the land. Why? Fear. Samuel. They came to crown King Samuel king. Do you know where he was? Hiding in the baggage. Pretending to be a suitcase. He, you know the same, 1 Samuel 15, when God said, go destroy the Amalekites, and they were supposed to kill all the animals and everything, and they, brought, they kept some of the best. He says, I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. 1 Samuel uh, 19 through 31, David flees from Saul. Did you know that David had already been uh, anointed to be king when he married Michael and Saul comes to kill him and he runs? Did you realize he didn't have to run? That Saul either couldn't kill him, God would have struck him down, or God would have resuscitated him. He's already promised to be the king. So how's he going to be king under the promise of God if he's dead? Can't happen. But he runs anyway. He doesn't. His fear shut down his spiritual logic. When believers habitually react to the changes in their life with fear. Are you afraid of change? It reveals that you're choosing to imagine and then believe that God is either uncaring about you, maybe He's vengeful, getting back at your sins, or maybe He's unable to honor His Word. You believe that, rather than attaching your faith to the promise He's given us. Something happens and you react with fear. What is it you told yourself? Uh-oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose everything. Uh-oh, this is going to hurt me. Uh-oh, it's going to hurt someone I love. As if... That is not in God's hands. No, it's not in God's hands. It's in my hands. I've got to be afraid somehow that's going to protect from these things happening. What you're believing is the things that make you afraid. You're believing that God is not really with you, that God is not really made you part of his family, that he's not going ahead of you, that he's not already answered your prayers. Fear shuts you down. This is Hebrews 4, the Exodus generation again. Uh, Abraham, how about this for a husband? He pretends that, of course, Sarah was his half-sister, but he pretends that that's his sister and gives her over to Abimelech. So did Isaac. I'm sure that endeared her to him to give her up that way finally God is not the source of fear in the believer's life the Christian life operates on faith not fear <clears throat> so fear in your heart that's not from God God does not put fear in your heart no now the word of God Bible doctrine looking at a situation can tell you no 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 and that can produce fear and that's a legitimate thing but 
God is not using fear to motivate you or drive you. He uses the Word of God and faith. God has already won. He has already won your marriage. Now, are you willing to enter in and trust Him for your part of it, to do your role in it that He has prescribed for you, regardless of what your mate's doing or not doing? This is where you're going to grow. God's going to use this conflict for your growth, for your perfection, for your maturity, for your joy, for your peace, and capacity to love. That's what it's for. What's the conflict for? It's for growth. It's not to destroy your life. It's not to destroy your marriage. It's for you to grow. Embrace it. Embrace the conflict. Look for the spiritual solution. The spiritual solution is always to change me. The answer is to change me. So, all right. Anybody want to throw tomatoes or anything? Rhonda and I want you to know y'all are our family. We love you very much. And if there's any way that we can help you in your spiritual life, then please call on us and we'll be available for you. Let's close. Father, please show us our fear. Please show us that fear controls and dominates much of our life. Fear of measuring up to others, our peers, our other family members. Uh, fear of not being good enough. Uh, fear of being found deficient. Fear of not being wanted and not being loved. Fear of being rejected. You know, fear of failing. So many fears. So many things that we have attached ourselves to that in an inordinate way, Father, that we're now afraid in our life. That's not your plan. You've already won everything. You've, it's already won. We've already won, Father. We can enter into this faith with the promises and the principles and walk in this and win our marriages and win our partner and win our children and, and win our nation back. And that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.